Welcome to Equestrian Adventuresses, the show for women who love horses, travel, and adventure. In today's episode, we talk to Jane from the UK about her adventures traveling the world on various horse riding tours. Jane is 61 years old and retired, and she shares with us her best and worst moments on riding trips abroad. She's ridden in countries like Bosnia, South Africa, and many more, and gives us a lot of really great tips on how you too can travel abroad on horse riding vacations. She also talks about helping out horses in Egypt and how you can also help save the horses there in Egypt. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention that this is the first episode of our second season and a lot of exciting changes are coming. Firstly, if you love the show, please, please leave us a review so I can give you a shout out on the show. Reviews help others to find us, and we really appreciate the support if you want to keep listening to the show. So if you're enjoying the show and you want more episodes and more podcast episodes, please, please, please leave a review. Last season on the show, we actually had the pleasure of interviewing women from around the world about their horse riding adventures, um, such as walking across Jordan with a donkey, buying horses in Albania and riding across Albania, surviving on a remote island in Ireland, and riding with penguins at the end of the world in Argentina. So if you haven't subscribed to the show or listened to the first season, please download them, uh, have a listen. You're definitely going to enjoy all of the the previous episodes. And I can't really say that I have a favorite because I absolutely enjoyed uh, talking to all of the ladies. I've really enjoyed having uh, such a variety of adventuresses on the show, but also I've been recently getting a lot of questions, and so it made me realize that, you know, there's probably a lot of questions from listeners about how they too can travel more or have adventures with horses, um, or maybe there's different topics that they want discussed. So what I would love to do is actually, if you're listening now, and you have a topic idea or any questions, please send me an email um, with, you know, your topic or questions or whatever, and also say your name and where you're from, so that way I can give you a shout out. And then what I want to do is start creating small, uh, short, like maybe 10-minute podcast episodes where I try and answer all of your questions um, or maybe even bring on ladies to discuss the topics which you have in mind Um, so, you know, these are going to be short little episodes. So if you have any ideas or questions that you want answered, send me uh, an email again with your name and where you're from and then the topic. And then that way I can give you a shout out on the show and try my best to answer your questions. So you can email me from our website, equestrianadventuresses.com. And yeah, that's it for now. So cue the theme song. We are explorers. We are trailblazers. We love to do what cannot be done. We love to test our limits, cross borders, and we love the freedom horses bring us. We seek lands without fences. Who are we? We are equestrian adventuresses. We are a community of women who love horses, travel, and adventure. To infinity! And beyond! And now your host, Crystal Kelly. Hello, adventuresses. I'm talking to Jane. So, hi, Jane. I would just love it if you could just introduce yourself and just give a little bit about your background of where you're from and what kind of horsey background you have. Hi. Hi, I'm Jane. Um, I live in East Sussex in the UK and I'm 61. And I've been riding uh, pretty much constantly since I was 12, uh, but I've never owned a horse. Um, so I tend to ride other people's horses and exercise for them and go on as many riding holidays as I can fit in. So what kind of riding holidays have you been on so far? And like maybe some highlights of, I don't know, some of the destinations you've traveled and ridden with horses. Okay. Um, Well, I've probably been doing riding holidays for 20 years now since I wish I'd discovered them earlier when I was younger. But um, and I used to just do one one a year when I was working. But now I'm retired. I'm doing lots. So between sort of six plus a year uh, as you know, as many as I can afford, really. 
um, while I'm fit. Um, the highlights, the the sort of some of the best. Well, one of the best ones. I'm I'm still going there. Sort of um, 15 years later, I started going uh, in 2005. Um, which is in in southern Spain, and I'm about to go back there um, in a couple of weeks. So um, that that's been a very reliable, fast, uh, good horses um, riding, lovely scenery riding holiday. Um, and another highlight was when I discovered South Africa um, a few years ago, about four years ago now. Um, before that, I'd never ridden outside Europe. Um, but now every year I um, I make it um, a policy to go back to South Africa and now to make sort of good use of the um, you know the fact that the flight's quite expensive. So I try and do two holidays back to back now um, in different areas of, of the country so I can explore and see different scenery and um, different horses, different people. Um, so th- those are those are sort of a couple of highlights. Um, there is I do have one other favourite place that I have discovered and go back to a lot, which is in Bosnia. And um, so I'll be going back there again in um, uh, early June. So uh, yeah, that that's that that's sort of the highlights that I can I can think of. But um, I love you know I lo- I love the um, um, the variety of holidays and this just sort of the whole world to explore, really. So how did you find out about horse riding holidays? You know, like you said, you wish you'd found it earlier, but how, how did you get started with that? And then what made you keep going back again and again? Uh, how did that? Well, I, I, I think it was, um, I've, I found an agency. Um, I can't remember how because it was sort of pre-internet days. Um, but I went with, with an agency, and I've pretty much always gone with uh, different agencies over the years. Uh, and it's only sort of perhaps this year, co- this coming year, that I'm branching out more into going direct, booking direct with hosts. Um, but I'm still using um, an agency as well, because um, the, there are there are pluses for for both sides. So I, I'm actually interested to hear what the pluses for the both sides would be, because you know in our Facebook group we have kind of a mixture of people. There some are booking direct, some with agents, and I think it's kind of interesting to know why people would prefer to go with an agent, let's say, instead of booking directly with the stables. So what's your opinion on that? Okay, um, well I I have thought about it, and really the <laughs> I've, in my experience, uh, a good agent is is worth their weight in gold because uh, I don't know about other people, but I always, if I haven't been to a destination before, I always have an awful lot of questions, um, partly to reassure myself, but also to make sure it's the right sort of riding for me. Um, and an agent is brilliant because I would expect my agent to have visited the place and, and know it so that they can answer those questions without having to um, sort of engage in a conversation with a host, which um, can be difficult for them because, you know, they're out running their business um, and don't have um, the sort of fast, fast response times, which you normally would, I would expect from an agent. Um, so, so there's that, um, the, um, the, their website and being able to ask them questions. Uh, there is financial security. Um, the uh, the agency should be uh, registered um, with well I can't remember the organisation maybe it's at at all um, but basically if the um, the holiday where you're going were to go bust or they were to go bust then you would get your money back and I think that's important um, given that these holidays are not cheap you know you can be spending thousands of pounds and. Um, and I also found that the price, there was no price difference. So going direct, um, usually the price was the same as if I went through the agent. Um, and the agency that I use now, mostly, uh, they actually give me a loyalty discount. So that's uh, another reason to go with them. Um, 
And what else? Oh, yeah. The, I mean, it's sort of back up. It's security. If things go a bit wrong, um, that they're always there um, on the end of the phone or email to help sort things out. So that th those are sort of uh, some of the reasons why I, I would go with uh, an agent. Um, and... Oh, also another reason is the because I, I'm sort of quite specific about the sort of riding that I want. Um, the agent knows me now, um, so I'll just pick up the phone or drop a drop a line and say, right, I'm ready to book um, a holiday in X month or whatever. What what can you suggest? What's what I have? What what haven't I done? Um, what uh, what's going to suit the style of riding I like, um, so that that saves me having to wade through their website, um, or do loads of searches online to find places to wreck. I mean, I must say your your Facebook page is brilliant. That that has put me on to holidays, so I'm now starting to book direct. Um, it's it's found me a travelling companion that I'm about to meet tomorrow. Oh <laughs> uh, wow! We're going. We've booked a holiday together where we're booking direct. Um, oh, where are you guys going? It, it was recommended uh, on your uh, on your page, so we're going we're going there together. Where where are you guys going? Uh, that's Tunisia. Wow, that sounds amazing. Oh, that makes me very happy to hear that. that yeah, well, adventurous is exploring yeah. together because of my group. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. So I, I'm meeting Julie tomorrow um, in London because she lives up in. Um, sort of Nottingham area, quite a long way away. And, um, yeah, we're going to meet up and hope that we get on. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then we're looking forward to going off to um, Tunisia together a month later. That's great. And um, that's actually part of why I made Adventuresses was because I wanted to have this connection with other ladies. And there was a... Um, when I was putting together that catalog, you know, that lists all of the yeah. horse stables in all the countries, you know, there's a lot of places in that catalog that you won't really find on the agents. Um, That's true. Lists. And I always like to go to the, the weird places, let's say, so that's that's very nice that you're that you're doing that. So you know, you and I were kind of mentioning this um, earlier today, not you know on the podcast yet, but you like to go on fast rides and you know uh you, you like the um speedier rides you don't want just some yeah. nose to tail kind of trail so do you have any i don't know rides that you've ridden that were particularly faster than others or share some of your stories or experiences okay. with with that okay well uh, the two of the favorites that i've mentioned already um are that are favorites because they're fast riding um <laughs> So the, there's one in southern Spain um, and there's the one in Bosnia. So you get a, you get plenty of really fast canters, really long canters, um, some galloping as well, and and the horses are really safe and uh, the terrain is is perfect for it and it's just yeah yeehaw it's great <laughs> fantastic puts a smile on your face yeah. Perfect. So I'm actually thinking about maybe moving to Spain just because even in my own group, there's like so many people that are riding in Spain. So yeah. what are your recommendations? Is there certain areas that are, I don't know, having, I, cause I know some areas are really mountainy and others are like beach mm. riding. So what's some yeah. of your highlights of some of the rides you've done in Spain? Well, I, I think a really good area is the area that I like going back to, which is um, Andalusia. Um, so I'm I'm about uh, in a week's time I'm going off to Spain um, and I'm doing two holidays back to back um, and the first one is in um, north of Her of Jerez um, in um, uh, it's it's actually a dressage place um, and I'm meeting up with some other girls who are coming it's we're a real international group and that's been put together by someone i met on instagram um and she's put it together direct with the host um and recruited everyone through instagram and um 
there so that is on the edge of a national park um and they have a sort of um there's another stable very close to them in the same town um that i'm going to go and visit because they do more of the sort of the the trail and the day rides uh she doesn't do holidays per se but i've already spoken to her and um she says it's if i can sort out my own accommodation and and a car um you know I can put a small group together and she could take us out for um, a different sort of day ride uh, every day of the week if we wanted to do that. So I'm sort of planning to do that next, uh, probably this time next year. Um, and as I say, that that's in a national park. So the going is, is very, um, in that area, it's very sort of, it's sandy. Um, sandy and f- sort of forested with pine trees, uh, very beautiful. Um, br- um, what are they called? I always call them broccoli trees. They, I think they're um, the the pine nut pine, pine trees. So they they look like clouds, green clouds. They're very very pretty, and the going is always good, and the the weather is pretty good all year round. Um, and in the second week, I'm going a bit further south. Um, nearer to the coast um, and going back to one of my favourites, as I said, that I've been going to for 15 years. Um, and there we'll, we have uh, beach gallops. So I always time it um, for when the tide is right for, for the best gallops. So I know that I know the question to ask uh, the host because that, that's one that I've always booked. Uh, book direct although they do um, go through a, uh, agencies as well so um, yeah I, w- I would definitely recommend you looking at um, and parts of Andalusia and if you like beach riding and um, then obviously the coastal areas with the the national parks perfect I, I'm definitely going to do that because I'm uh, I'm actually Californian and I miss having palm trees <laughs> there wasn't oh. any palm trees in England <laughs> where I was living <laughs> So I'm excited to have palm trees in my life again. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll get one or two of those in, yeah. in southern Spain. That's oh, for sure. Perfect. And so you've been going to the same ones again and again, which I no, think is... Oh, no. No? Um, there are very few places that I'll go back to. Okay. I go, I go to way more places than um, ones that I go back to. Okay. So... What is it that you're looking for then when you're looking for a new destination? Is it just, you know, a place that I haven't been to before, let's give it a try? Or what's your criteria when you're shopping? Uh, okay. Um, so my tick boxes, um, the questions I always ask are about the pace. Uh, is the terrain suitable for um, plenty of varied pace? Not always cantering, but I, you know, I like trotting too. Uh, but I don't, I definitely do not want to walk for hours or even sort of an hour at a time, because I find it just breaks my body. I mean, I just get so sore with walking. Um, and I do tend to suffer from saddle sores, so I have to be quite careful. Um, and so it's the ter- I ask about the terrain and the pace, um, the size of the group, because I don't like large groups. Uh, so I, I don't really like it if there's any more than uh, five or six, five or six people. Um, and a lot of places nowadays seem to have very large groups, like nine, ten, or even twelve, which is way too big for me. That's quite uh, a big group, yeah. It is, yeah. Particularly if you've got the guide, and if you have a backup guide as well. Yeah. Um, I also ask, oh, where um, in terms of accessibility, um, how to get there? I prefer to fly from a particular air- airport in the UK from Gatwick um so again the age the agent if I go through an agent they can always help me with that um because that will discount some places if you can only fly from Stansted or you know some other a- airport that I find it harder to get to um another question would be um the well probably the 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 type of the type of horse, I'm, you know, I'm happy to ride any type of horse, usually small ones. I like small ones because I'm petite. Um, 
and I find that they've got more personality, small horses. Uh, what else do I look? Oh, I, I check the weather and the good time of year to go um, because I'm a bit of a fair weather rider. So I, uh, but I also don't want it really hot. Um, so I don't mind a bit of light rain, and most most weeks you'll probably get one one day or part of a day where you've got to get your rain gear out. But um, I don't. I would really not want to be rained on every day of the week, obviously, because um, you just can't dry out. And um, so yeah, usually there are better times of year to go but i often go low season so i'll like for example i go to spain in january and most people don't go so the groups are smaller and um the weather's still good you know it'll be in the mid-teens um perfect for riding and uh, i would avoid going places that just get too hot so usually in july and august i don't go in in europe because it's just too hot. And I think one of the things that maybe sometimes stops people from taking these trips is actually money or budget. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously there are some tours or trips which are very expensive, but I feel like there's also a lot which are quite budget friendly. So what, what are your thoughts on that? And, you know, what, how have you been able to sort of manage as far as going on all of these trips and, and being able to, to pay for that? Yeah, I mean, riding holidays, it's, they are not the cheapest, but, you know, things like skiing is not, not cheap either. Um, so I am very budget conscious, uh, and because of that, I can do several holidays a year. Um, so I tend to have in my head, if it's in Europe, I don't like to spend more than sort of £1,200. Um on a, on a trip and I would look for that, that to be sort of fully inclusive of um, all the um, all the food and um, drinks and maybe you might have to pay extra for transfers uh, and obviously tips but I don't I don't want to have to, lots of extras I mean some, some some places are just a bit weird the way they uh, they handle the, the pricing um, but you know that's that's their privilege um so yeah um and if i have lately been sort of expanding my budget because i want to go to for example in south africa i've got to spend more um although some of the holidays i've i've discovered don't have to be that expensive when you get there but obviously the flight is can be as the same price as the holiday it's um it's certainly not cheap to get there um and i i wait until the sales and uh so ba and virgin tend to have sales a couple of times a year um and i've also recently joined um paid membership for jack's uh jack's flight club um which is um it specializes in in finding its members cheap flights all over the world and uh, they send emails out with all the deals they're discovering so a couple of times a week so that's always interesting reading um so and, and i'm now booking quite a long time ahead so i'll book the holiday but i won't buy the flight until the right deal comes along so that that sort of can save a bit of money um what else um I, yeah i mean there's no getting away from it that it, it's it's not particularly cheap you have to be able to afford um probably um, at least a thousand pounds to be able for a week to to go on a riding holiday so i i that will discount um the um yeah it'll it'll stop some people from being able to go i'm sure it's uh, worth it. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, it's 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 worth it. Yeah, I know. But if you if you're not very experienced and and you're a bit anxious and and then it's the cost as well, it, it can be a bit daunting. Um, I mean, I I regularly travel on my own now, and I don't really worry about it. And quite often, lately, I I've, I've ended up being the only guest. Um, that that's not quite so good being the only guest. 
I mean, in, in the day, it's absolutely fabulous because it means that you can have exactly the ride that you want. And there's no, you know, no quibbling about the horses because I, again, I like to change horses and ride different horses for the variety. Um, so I get to try lots of horses. And, um, but in the evenings after the host has gone, that can be a bit lonely. So yeah, I have to make sure that if I know I'm going to be the only guest, I'm, I take, uh, I take a book, I take my, um, Zen tangling, which is one of my hobbies. And I, have a few um, films or programs downloaded on on a tablet, so I can I can look at that as well. So I keep myself occupied, and it's and it's it's always worked out fine. I've always enjoyed it. So can you share maybe a, a story or two of I don't know maybe a moment or a adventure that you had where you thought, yes, this is exactly why I'm doing this. Ah, well, last year. Um, my favourite moment um, or favourite day, and it made oh, I was just I was just so happy by the end of it. Um, I I went to I was in South Africa. I was on my second holiday. Uh, it, it was a place I hadn't been to before. It was um, um, Cape Winelands um, in uh, near Cape Town, and I was asked because I was the only guest for the whole week and I was asked by the host uh, if I would like to go drag hunting I've never been drag hunting before and um, I said hmm, yes okay I'll give it a go because <laughs> obviously he wanted to go and so and so did um, um, a member of his staff um, so if I'd said no they wouldn't have been able to go and so I I, I picked that one up and I thought nah Give it a go, Jane. Give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> they reassured me that it, I would be fine. And I'm so glad I went. It was apps. Oh, I've never been so happy on a horse. Oh, it was fantastic. I was riding a little pony, little red roan called Olympia, who was a rescue from um, the township. She'd been a cart horse, skin and bone with a foal. And um, they had rescued her and um, brought her brought her back and I mean, she was such a willing little pony. She was fantastic, and she wasn't a jumper. She hadn't. Uh, she, she'd she'd give it a go over the little tiny little jumps, but she wasn't um, at that point. She wasn't really a jumper. I, I believe that they're giving her some lessons for me now because I'm going to go back. Um, and uh, it it was just really friendly. Um, it was the last meet of the season. And uh, they had the biggest field that um, they'd had all season. There was um, about 57 people, um, sort of men, women, children, um, little girls on lead reins and you know, all sorts there. And you, you go off, there were, th were sort of three groups they asked that there was the sort of the really forward group there was a middle group and and a slow slower group at the back each of them had their own sort of person in charge and you you didn't go past that person and um i actually ended up in the first group but at the back of the first group because then i didn't have to worry about holding people up and people coming up behind me so that that proved to be the perfect position it was quite fast but I, I didn't have to worry about crowds of people around me. And uh, uh, the, it, was, it was on a sort of a private estate and they had built the jumps specially out of natural you know, logs and things like that. And they were all very small jumps and they were to one side of the track. So you, you were sort of uh, following a um, – there were legs. I think there were six legs, each of about two kilometres. Um, and – you basically were cantering for that for a, that whole two kilometres, and then if you wanted to, you could pop over these little jumps to the side, um, and and it was really really deep going. I was a bit concerned about how deep the sand was, um, but Olympia was game. She was not going to give up. She was okay. She wasn't fast like the, some of the thoroughbreds there, but she was not going to give up. She just kept going. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, we had a fantastic time. And then um, after each leg, they, they would have a break for sort of quarter of an hour. 
and halfway through they had some a buffet and um some um drinks and we had a little longer break uh, and then at the end when we were, had all finished so that was about 12 kilometers um we we all had a barbecue and uh, dance and disco and it was just i was just so happy it was fam- fabulous it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. I actually I haven't tried a, a drag hunt yet, although I was invited in Ireland a couple of times, but I, I didn't know if I was brave enough to attempt it. But <laughs> oh, I think yeah, I think they they might be much much tougher. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they sounded pretty crazy here in Ireland. I was, woo! <laughs> but it, it sounded tempting, definitely. And and they said the same. They said that the little ponies are actually more fun because mm-hmm. they kind of climb over obstacles instead of jump them and they kind of um, yeah they can keep yeah. up with the big ones so i think that's that's quite fun yeah no it was it was definitely it was it was huge fun and most of that was down to olympia and so you know on these holidays you know you mentioned you're you're 60 yeah um so how so do you, 61 61 okay have you I don't know. Did you have any concerns when you started these horse riding holidays? Like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to keep up or I'm going to get sore or if I'm in the middle of nowhere, you know, (laughs) how how have you kind of handled that? And I mean, obviously you're very young, probably more fit than me. Um, But yeah, what what are your thoughts about that? Uh, Well, I suppose I'm sort of naturally fit and I, I'm, make sure that I keep up my my fitness uh, doing Pilates and um, ride it. I I exercise this X-Race horse a couple of times a week, so that sort of keeps me at um, riding fitness. Um, and when I when I go away, I I take all the sort of the blister plasters, this the Sudacrem, um, all all the the potions and and lotions that you might need to ease and and prevent saddle sores um and in in fact i mean i had a situation where a few a few years ago uh, four years ago five years ago now i had breast cancer um and as a result of the treatment and going on um a particular drug called tamoxifen it it thinned my skin and I was getting terrible problems every holiday I went went on. The skin would break um, on my bum, and it was oh, it was agony. It was it was really unpleasant, and it made riding very uncomfortable. And I it limited my riding. I had to select holidays which had no more than sort of four hours riding a day. Um, and there aren't that there are far fewer holidays that do that little riding. Um, and I couldn't do trails because that that was too long in the saddle, and uh, and also if, if things my had if I'd got too uncomfortable that I couldn't ride, that would have caused a bit of a problem if if I was on a trail. So I always went for centre based ones. And then um, with um, a friend made made the observation and sort of put two and two together that uh, I was having these saddle sores because I was on this medication. Uh, so I went to uh, talk to my consultant and he said, oh, no one's ever no one's ever mentioned that. No one's ever had this problem before. And I said, oh, I can't believe that. Right. You, you must have had loads of people that are cyclists, even if they're not riders like me. Um, he's oh, well, no, no one's mentioned it. So he he said that um, um, with the GP as well, we agreed that I could use some topical estrogen cream um on my skin in that area down below um and just prior to a holiday and during a holiday so last year i started doing that and it made all the difference all the difference so now i don't get the saddle sores and it's and i can now start thinking about doing slightly longer in the saddle and uh, not worrying about it <laughs> so um yeah if if any ladies out there are of my sort of age um and have have had that sort of problem it it might be because your skin has got rather thin um and you need so to actually use some estrogen cream and uh you need to talk to your doctor about that 
Yeah, no, that's great advice because that's one of the common questions that comes up in the group is what do I do about saddle sores? Um, mm -hmm. But I, I love listening to you. It's funny that you say your shorter rides were four hours because <laughs> most people would think that that's the longer rides. Um, so you're obviously a tough cookie. Um, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> <I'm trying to. laughs> yes but you know it comes with being a horse rider i think the stuff that that us horse riders do for fun you know normal people just wouldn't understand yeah that, yes that's yeah i mean if, if you're not um a sort of an experienced or capable rider four hours in the saddle would be absolute murder and doing it day after day but you just wouldn't survive would you oh yeah um and, and as far as you know Again, talking about maybe like a favorite highlight or something, because I've definitely been in some nature or scenery, scenic places where I was like, this place had to have been seen on horseback because it just wouldn't have been the same. Um, do you have maybe a special place like that where it was just more special because you were on a horse? Ooh, um, I think I might fall at the hurdle there. Um, there. I'm... I can't think I can't think of it. I mean, I'm obviously when I'm most of the places I'm riding, you, you could only get there on a horse because the, we're not using tracks. We're going along sandy paths or um, I mean, I guess you might get there with a bicycle, um, but it would be pretty hard going. Um, say in, in Bosnia, we're going for miles over um these beautiful meadows with uh, spring flowers. That's why I want to go back in early June again, because uh, the first time I went there was at that time of year and the flowers, it was absolutely stunning. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a very high plateau. Uh, it's at about 1200 1, meters. Um, it's surrounded. It's ringed by um, mountains, but you've got this enormous um, meadow land uh, it goes on for miles and kilometers and kilometers and um, there are no fences and it's it's not there's obviously no insecticides and they they just use it they seem to use it for uh, pasture and for making hay and um, so there's all these beautiful flowers that that was just stunning um, and we're just sort of wandering through the middle of these fields we're not even following uh, tracks uh, we're finding our way through um, through these sort of wild meadows, uh, so you definitely couldn't get there by uh, by car and even a bicycle. As I say, yeah, it would be pretty tough going. Perfect. And so I want to switch it a little bit and ask the more difficult question, which is, you know, have you had situations where? It, you've come across some challenges or some difficult situations and then what did you do to overcome that or maybe what advice do you have for others um, to prevent that or if something like that happens? Um, yeah, well, yes, I have had a couple of uh, bad incidents, in fact, very recently, one um, last year and one the year before uh, for different reasons. Um the the one the first one was where the uh, it was in Portugal, and it was a, a dressage and and hacking combo, and um, the the host was uh, very inappropriate with me, <laughs> and got me drunk, um, and was um, just came on very strong in a bar. Uh, I'm so grateful that I had two friends with me because. As I say, I was drunk and I wasn't really um, coping and I actually got quite scared and they they just sort of took care of the situation and make sure made sure that I got home safe and then looked after me when I got back. Um, and the next day um, I, I thought I'd, it was near the end of the holiday. Um, it's it's always really tricky um, what you do because uh, you, um, particularly being British, you don't want to cause a stir. Um, so, and I don't didn't want to be a killjoy, um, and I didn't want an atmosphere with uh, with with the host. Um, but I decided that I would address it with him um, 
because otherwise he would just think he could carry on the same way. And um, but I kept it light um, in my language. And I sort of said, yeah, last night that wasn't on, uh, you know, I'm not having it. And no hanky panky. Then I had to explain what hanky panky was because <laughs> um, <laughs> his English wasn't perfect. Um, but he got the message. Uh, and when I got home, I made a full report to the agent and um, I was backed up by the by the other two because uh, we'd all uh, we'd all booked through the same agent and they supported me. And um, I asked her to sort of be aware that if she was sending a woman on her own, um, that she probably ought to warn that woman that uh, he because uh, we did discover he was a, a serial he, he, he did this all the time. He was married. We met his wife. I already, in fact, had met his wife before, uh, but she wasn't there during the week. And he, we were told that he regularly did this with, with the guests. Um, and I, I understand that actually uh, many, um, many people, when they go on holiday, they're sort of after a bit of flirtation and, um, um, you know, bit of sex maybe yeah with they and they will approach the guides and, and the hosts and that goes on as well so it's it's sort of two way it's not always um you know I, I i wasn't looking for it and was very surprised that it happened um partly because of my age um but you know it's and i was very discombobulated by the whole thing but we got through we certainly won't be going back there again um um but, yeah, it, it wasn't a nice experience. And it was a shame because he was an excellent teacher. Uh, he had lovely horses. Um, you know, he looked after us really well. The accommodation was good. You know, we would have gone back, but yeah, he ruined it and uh, with that inappropriate uh, behaviour. So um, that's, that's that. Um, and then there was a, an incident uh, – slightly different inci incident um, last year um, where the guide, not, not the host, the, the hosts were lovely, uh, but the guide, for some reason, perhaps because it was the last ride of the year, um, he, he just was a bit, he went crazy. I mean, he, he was just so unprofessional and he was sort of telling tales and telling sort of, well, telling, give, feeding us misinformation about what was going to happen and the length of, you know, he said, oh, we're going to trot now for 20 minutes or we're going to, uh, okay, we're going to walk now, but only for five minutes and then we're going to go for a, a gallop. Um, none of that was true. It never happened like that. Um, he, um, and, and then when we did go fast, it, it seemed to be in the wrong places. So um, it was on ground where I certainly wouldn't have gone fast if I'd been on my own. Um, and in the end, um, by the end of the week, I was really shaken up. And I'm an experienced rider. I'm confident. I like going fast. So I was really shocked at my, at my reaction and how actually I couldn't wait for that holiday to end. And uh, I wasn't the only one that felt like that. There was another woman who was an experienced rider, but she'd lost her confidence. And she was at the back out of choice. And she had a hell of a time. And I saw her, you know, several times close to tears. But she never said a word. Uh, she never complained. Uh, whereas I, uh, actually a couple of times at the risk of being a killjoy, um, called a halt and said, please stop. You know, my legs are getting really wobbly. We've been cantering and galloping now for so long. Um, and I, I need to stop because otherwise I'm going to fall off. So um, I had to, I did that a couple of times. And, um, yeah, no, no one got shirty with me. But, yeah, po possibly I'd called it a bit early for some of them. <laughs> um, but I, ha I, I have to look after my safety. And uh, certainly I didn't want to come off at a fast pace and um and then have my horse fly off and all that palaver of getting it back and maybe injuring myself so yeah i 
I I wasn't happy, um, but I handled that one differently. I I just felt that I I couldn't say anything at at the time, um, so I just reported it uh, to the agent. And again, the friends that I was with also had felt very uncomfortable with um, you know, the unpredictability of the of the guide and his behaviour. He was making his horse do tricks and things. Um, and making it rear and um, making it do this funny jumping with all four feet off the ground. And uh, oh, he was, I felt so sorry for the horse. Um, poor little thing. He was, tr- every time he, we came to a stop, it was trembling. And, um, but it always did. He could, he could uh, get it to do stuff just with voice commands. He was, um, you know, he, he was, he wasn't a bad rider. He just, was a show off he was acting like a little child and um i felt very uncomfortable i just couldn't trust him that that's what it came down to i i learned from that how important it is that you trust your guide that they will get you through they will look after you they might push you you know might take you faster than or on you know a bit faster over ground that you're not used to going over um but if you trust them then it's fine. But if you don't trust them, then it becomes a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, I think these are both um, good topics that you've brought up because I've definitely witnessed, I mean, you know, as a woman traveling around, you'll you'll meet men coming on to you and things like that. Um, mm. But especially when you're traveling and then, like you said, to have somebody um, sort of galloping around in the wrong places and not necessarily knowing what's best for you know the group let's say um yeah yeah he he basically misread the group and what we wanted we wanted to go fast but we wanted to be safe yeah and he just wasn't safe and you know do you feel like because i've seen this kind of stuff in a lot of male dominated places which is why i think i like to uh with the whole adventuresses you know empower women so i find a lot of women running stables and leading trips and guides and have you had any experiences where you've maybe noticed i mean obviously there's good men as well that are giving rides but you know have you noticed that maybe there is a difference when you come across a place that's maybe run by a woman or has a woman guide or or something like that um i must say most of the places i go to are run by men thinking about it um i did go on one uh, uh trail last last year to hungary uh that was run by a woman um she was the guide and and the host um she ran it with her husband but he wasn't a rider um she yeah i mean she 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 was possibly um a, the opposite she she was a little too safe mm. <laughs> um well, it wasn't quite as fast as i would have liked um and i think everyone felt that it it was you know she was she was concerned about the horse the horses i understand that um they are her livelihood and and so am i i mean i don't want to go i don't want to give the wrong impression i i i don't like going bat out of hell all the time it's inappropriate places you know, maybe just once a day you might have a really fast canter or um, a gallop, but uh, not all the time. Um, but we we just didn't get, I think, we a couple of times during the week. And uh, she said, OK, do you want a gallop? OK, you can do it in that field. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and then we had a little race and that was really fun. Um, but yeah, she she was protect very protective of her horses, um, and and rightly so. I understand that, so I just went along with that, you know. And you know, she's she's the boss at the end of the day. Uh, I'm the guest, but you know, she's the boss. Well, it's good that you had said something because I think a lot of people, like you said, they don't say something, and I think that's where the problem is. Is if you come across something like that you know, maybe it's almost too late for your trip if it's at the end of the trip or something, as you mentioned, but Mm. at least the next person will avoid that sticky situation. Um, So I think that that's good. Do you have any other tips or advice for 
anyone? I mean, I know like we had spoken about, it's kind of hard when you're searching on the internet in a country, maybe you haven't been before to spot stuff like that, but maybe you have some advice or tips on, you know, what, what to look for, what, what to do. Um, well, as I say, you need to do your research before, before you book, whether you're going direct or, or through an agent, um, and, and just sort of know yourself. What, what, what sort of riding do you like doing? What, what floats your boat? Um, do you want, you know, some people just like long, long hours in the saddle. And they don't mind if you're doing a lot of walking because if you if you're riding for you know seven hours, um, you have to do a lot of walking. Otherwise, and particularly on a trail, you know when you're on the same horse all week, um, the you know poor animals get exhausted. Um, so you have to allow them to to, uh, to recoup between you know, trotting and cantering. Um, what you know, what sort of terrain do you like riding in? Do you want to ride in in the mountains uh, or do you want to ride much more on the flat or do you want beaches or, or you know uh, you, you you need to put together a sort of a tick list uh, of what is important to you uh, what sort of horses do you like riding um, do you, do you like you know, slower horses or really fast f- uh, forward horses that you know are, are a, you know got a lot of character and personality um, or do you like something more of a steady eddy uh, who'll look after you um, and make sure that, that, you know, they've got the type of horse that you like to ride? Um, what else? Um, yeah, yeah, if it's important to you, um, if you're temperature or mosquito uh, sensitive, then you need to sort of check those things out. Um and uh, and I, I always ask, um, what is the the nearest town uh, to the place where I'm going to ride uh, to get the uh, local weather forecast? And um, you can go onto AccuWeather um, and put in that place, um, and then you can see both forward weather patterns, um, temperatures and precipitation. Uh, but also you can you can look back and see historic averages and um, actuals from the previous year or even multiple, you know, go back several years if uh, you're particular, uh, particularly sensitive to not riding when it's wet or if it's um, you want to avoid e- extreme heat. Uh, so I, I often do that if it, if it's a new place. I'll, I'll I'll check out the weather patterns in, historically as as well as uh, going forward. So tell me another highlight about one of your favorite uh, travel experiences. Well, that has to be um, a couple of years ago. I was going on a non-riding holiday to Egypt um, with with a with a friend, couple of friends, and um, because we were g- going to start in Cairo. Uh, I, for many years, have been supporting uh, an equine charity out there called Prince Fluffy Kareem. Um, they do absolutely amazing work. It's run by a Norwegian woman called Marte. Uh, it's a UK charity, but it runs in Cairo. And um, so because I was going out, I organised with the UK president, Emma, um, to uh, buy a load of stuff that they needed so my friends and I raised the money and paid to pay for it. And then uh, Emma sent me all, all the stuff, vet wrap, uh, medications, um, uh, fly fringes, um, all the stuff they needed. I think there was even a foal blanket, a uh, foal rug <laughs> was one of the things we needed to take out. Um, and I got an extra large suitcase from a friend and uh, – about two thirds of that suitcase was filled with all this stuff that I was taking out for uh, PFK and got there first you know, on the first day and they came and picked me up and I spent the day with them and went around the three, uh, the three places where they, they have the horses. And, um, but if, if you're not familiar with the charity, it's, um, 
the purpose is to um, sort of rescue and um, patch up the working animals in uh, in Cairo and close by. Um, they they also have camels and donkeys and mules, um, even dogs and cats. Now they're 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 taking those in, um, and they provide all this treatment free of charge, uh, however long it takes to get these horses back on back on their feet. And they do it. They also do an awful lot of uh, education. That that's really educating the owners is is the way forward. Um, so so they do they they do that as well. And they entirely depend on on funding from their um, from their supporters who are around the world, mostly women. Um, and they they have a fantastic Facebook page, and they're really really good at communication communication through that. Um, Prince Fluffy Kareem, and uh, so I went there, spent the day there uh, with with Marte, and the highlight, as a total surprise, it, it wasn't planned by either of us. She discovered that uh, I was giving up my a day of my holiday, and and therefore wasn't going to get to see the pyramids. And she said, "You must see the pyramids." And she was uh, she organised for uh, a horse to be brought round from the neighbouring. Uh, stable uh, a bay arab stallion uh, called gazelle uh, who was the most beautiful animal and uh, with a with a guide uh, mohammed and they um, we went off to the pyramids and it was i must say it was about 11 yeah 11 midday something like that it was really really hot but because it was so hot there were no tourists so we had the place to ourselves pretty much and it was fantastic just riding in amongst the pyramids and seeing, uh, yeah, it was seeing the cat. There were camels around and um, we actually dismounted at one point and he, he got me into uh, one of one of the tombs, which wasn't normally uh, used by tourists. And yeah, for an hour I was I was in heaven. I was on this fantastic stallion, uh, really beautiful animal, really well looked after, and seeing seeing the desert as it's supposed to be seen from the back of a horse, and and then got back and uh, got whisked off to some of the um, other locations where uh, Prince Fluffy Kareem keeps uh, keeps some of the animals that they uh, can't can't work again, so they um, they retire them. And uh, they live a, a life of leisure. They've got about two hundred horses now um, that they uh, that they look after. And I actually got to meet the horse that I sponsor, that I pay towards every month. So I'm one of his aunties, and I got to meet Serene, and he's such a gentle soul. Oh, it makes me uh, choke up just thinking about it. He's he, he's had a terrible life. But he's just so gentle and he was really sweet. And I got to I got to take him for a little munch on some of the grass uh, in the shade. And uh, we chilled out together for a quarter of an hour or so. And it was uh, it was a very memorable moment. I think that's uh, very powerful because I actually I lived in Egypt for two years and the pyramid horses. That's what we always called them. Yes. But the pyramid horses are always so skinny. And like you said, just. Mm -hmm dragging these carts up these ridiculously steep, slippery little hills with the yes. cart full of tourists in them, obviously not no horsey breaks. tourists. And it's just awful and painful to see. And you want to just rescue all of them and scoop mm -hmm. them all up and, and protect them. And it's amazing to know that there's someone out there that's doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think that is great that you could actually see the horse that you're sponsoring. I know you mentioned to me in the email that they have a lot of, I think you said they have a lot of Facebook page likes but that not so many people are donating yes yeah that so they've got 185,000 uh followers now on facebook which is amazing but um mate told me um uh, the other day that only one percent of those actually donate any money so they, they get you know thousands of likes for every photograph that she puts up and every story that she reports on you know their latest inmate or their you know before and after story she's very good at that um but only one percent actually put their hands in their pocket yeah 
And and how much is it to sponsor a horse? Uh, it I pay ten pounds a month. Um, so basically, each horse costs about hundred pounds a month to uh, to feed and um, to care uh, for its care. So each horse tends to have ten aunties. Okay. So for ten pounds a month, you can help these horses in Egypt. That seems like a pretty good deal to me. Um, exactly. Yeah. So I think I think that's a, an important thing to say. You know, you you have to take action. You can't just like the photos. Uh, you know, you have to actually contribute. Or you know what you did? Like you went on a totally non horsey trip, and you had a suitcase full of stuff to bring to them. And that's, I think, really great because there's so many places and I, that's why I was working abroad the past 10 years. I was sort of educating people and trying to get them to use tech correctly and, yes. you know, just really small, simple things. And it's not that the yeah. locals don't want that information. So in my experience, if you bring them, you know, a snaffle bit, they'll use it. If you bring them, you know, a saddle pad... A or yeah, a fluffy nose band. Exactly. The they have people making these soft uh, fabric um, nose bands that can thread over the chains that they use because oh. they have chain halters. Yes, perfect. You know what? That's that's great, and I'm I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, that that's a fantastic chair. I'm just in awe of what they achieve with um, with so little. Perfect. Yeah. So Prince Fluffy Kareem, I will definitely link them and I will, I'll try to get her on the podcast at some point because I would love to yeah, hear more that about that. Yeah. yeah, that would be so good. Thank you so much. I feel like you've given a lot of, of really good tips and advice. And uh, I know I wrote down some notes, so I'm going to include some of those links like AccuWeather and stuff in the, in the show notes for people. Um, but is there a place where people can follow your adventures? I know you mentioned you have an Instagram account or, or where can we follow along? Uh, well, I, I always, when I'm going on my little adventures, I always sort of post the, the best pictures, uh, each day, um, on both my Instagram and my Facebook account. Um, I am, uh, Jane Lee 1958. So that's, uh, Lee spelt L W E. Um, yeah, Jane Lee 1958 is, uh, on both accounts. Perfect. And again, I'll include that so people can find you. I know I've shared some of your pictures because I definitely yeah, enjoy yeah. looking at a lot of your posts. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for, for coming on today. And I really appreciate having you. It's It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me. You have been listening to the Equestrian Adventuresses podcast. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website, equestrianadventuresses.com, for links to the show notes. Leave us a review and consider becoming a premium member for bonus episodes and footage. More information can be found on our website. Until next time, adventuresses, happy trails. Happy trails.